Hello and welcome to Comicana. I'm Hass, and each episode we're going to take a look at some of the hidden artistry in the pages of comic books. Visual storytelling is all about, you guessed it, using the visuals to tell the story. Something I was always taught when studying film was if someone watched a film without sound, would they still understand the relationship between the characters? Would they still understand the story? If not, something's probably gone wrong. This is the same for any visual medium, and indeed should be the same for comics, as they are a visual medium. For an artist, when drawing their page, they are working without the luxuries of having the word balloons already placed on the page. They're attempting to design the story without that there. David Finch has been doing this for a while and can be argued has gained some level of superstar status within the industry. When you look at a comic such as the new Batman series, written by Tom King and with colours by Jordi Belair, you can see why he's reached that level. As always on Comic Arna, I want to look at a very specific set of pages as an example. In this Batman series, we're faced with two new characters, Gotham and Gotham Girl. And if we take a look at issue 2, there is a panel in which they're presented this big, single splash page. What to you does this read like? Do we assume these people are heroes, villains, powerful, weak? To me, and hopefully to most of you, they look powerful, strong, heroic. How are we learning that though? The only text on the page is a single, don't worry, at the bottom. It's not really enough to learn a lot about the characters though, is it? So this information about what kind of people they are, that's all being told through the visuals. It's a clever mix of framing, character design, and colouring. So let's break down what's actually going on in this page to make that response happen. The first is the framing. If you frame someone head on, it creates kind of a neutral response. If you bring the camera, for lack of a better term, above them, looking down, it will make them look smaller. Perspective will shrink them, and it will make them look shorter and seem more childlike. Now, if, like in this example, you bring the camera below the characters, it actually works to elongate them. It also creates a sensation of looking up at someone, which in turn makes them seem bigger, stronger, more powerful. And you're getting that here, backed up by Jim Gordon in the corner of the page, covered in shadow and looking up. Which brings up another thing the page does, lighting. Finch is great with lighting, and if you look at any of his pages, you can see the considerations he makes for it. A few pages earlier, you have Jim Gordon in his office, and Finch uses shadows here from the lighting to draw your eyes to particular key moments and add impact to that final panel. So when you render these characters being hit by a light head on, it makes them look good. Traditionally, bad guys lurk in shadows, now good guys work in light, you know, Superman's powers are fueled by the sun. So we're being shown these characters in glorious, glorious detail in a huge panel, a splash page, in a powerful stance and powerful framing, and also making Jim Gordon look quite small in comparison. So let's turn the page and see how Finch renders Batman. And that's interesting, right? And already dramatically different. Batman is small in the frame. Whereas Gordon was small in the last image, now he's large in comparison, his head and shoulders taking up more room than the entirety of Batman's body. He's also shrouded in darkness, and only small bits of him are visible, as you can see he's behind the large lamp illuminating Gotham and Gotham Girl. When we punch in on Batman in the next panel, and then Gotham and Gotham Girl the panel after, you can see that direct contrast happening. With one, Batman is menacing, over half of him is pure black. With the others, it's mostly this golden yellow, and Finch has only rendered a small amount of shadows around them. There's something else happening here too. Batman is perched atop that stack chimney type thing, not entirely dissimilar to, say, a gargoyle, and because Belair has rendered the area of the roof a similar grey to Batman, he starts to blend into it all. This is helped by how Finch uses shadows on this set of pages too. If we flip ahead a page, Batman almost does just disappear into the background. Where the light hits the floor on the roof, you can see it's kind of yellow-grey, but the parts of the roof Batman sits on is all blue-grey. Yes, an indication of how the colour of light changes the colour of the surfaces it hits, but it's also cleverly designed to create some separation. Batman isn't the good guy here, you know, these two seem to be instead. He's part of the furniture of Gotham, like a gargoyle perched on the side of a building. He's as much a part of Gotham as this building is. If you place those two moments side by side, the splash of the two Gothams, and Batman here in the shadows, without any context or understanding of who these characters are themselves, who seems like the good guy? You'd definitely be forgiven for thinking Batman was the villain, and that's all thanks to the strength of the visual storytelling from Finch and Belair. And there's another moment of visual mastery in this issue that we can take a look at, and it highlights the difference between the Gothams and Batman again. At the beginning of the issue, the Gothams are fighting Solomon Grundy. In every moment of their interaction, you can see how strikingly big Grundy is in comparison to them. It happens panel after panel. Two pages in, you can see it in full force, as the fourth panel of this page, where Grundy throws Gotham away. The size difference is further extrapolated for the remainder of the page, where Gotham and Gotham Girl are shown to be tiny. It's reinforced too by the size of this statue, which only helps to make them seem smaller. But when we go to the next page, Batman turns up, and if you see the final panel of that sequence where Batman is crouched, he's actually a pretty similar size to Grundy in that frame. They take up a relatively similar amount of space. Turn the page, and Bats has got Grundy up in the air over his head. Sure, Grundy looks huge here too, but Batman outstretched and carrying him is a powerful visual, and the size, after making Gotham and Gotham Girl seem smaller and smaller, really makes him seem quite impressive. These pages work without dialogue, without captions. Sure, those things add context, but they need to add context to pages that already tell you a story. 
I focused on Finch, and in some cases Belair here, and what you've also got though is Tom King, who is a writer who knows how to use this medium, and understand it's primarily a visual medium. It's a creative team working at full strength in all areas. When looking at a comic, this should always be the case. The writing, as in the actual speech and captions, should be there to add flavour and context to the visuals, which really, ideally, you know, should be the thing doing the heavy lifting in terms of the story. After all, as I've said probably numerous times now, this is a visual medium, and it should be treated as such. Looking at the new Batman series, you've got a really good example of that. Thanks for watching. If you want to keep up to date with Comicana and the rest of the NerdSync shows, click subscribe below to get a whole host of great content. There's new videos every week, so don't miss out. If you're already caught up, click on the right to check out more analysis and comic book art breakdowns from my channel, Strip Panel Naked, where I release a new video every weekend. And for a little more, you can follow me on Twitter at HassanOE, where I do regular comic book page annotations too. You've been watching Comicana, I'm Hass, and I'll see you next time.